Uh, today, I have the pleasure of moderating a panel that is going to technically challenge me, so I'm just going to be really good at asking questions, hopefully. Uh, this is about account abstraction, which ha has been a part of Ethereum as a topic for a very long time. And now that we are post-merge, maybe we can actually redistribute some developer uh, uh, resources to building something that has always been talked about as something that is fundamentally crucial to the future of Ethereum. Uh, and every time I talk to somebody who's technically minded, they all say that we need account abstraction. It's not an option. We have to have it. So we're going to explore why everyone who's more technical than me are always like, yes, account abstraction, good. Uh, so on, we have Julian, Julian Nisa, the co-founder of Argent. He is here in the middle. There we go. And then on the far end, we have Yoav Weiss, the security researcher at the EF. And then in the middle here, sitting next to Vitalik, is Light Clients, AKA Matt. He's on the guest team. And then there's also Vitalik. What's up, guys? Yo. Yep. It's great to be here. Hi. So you guys can each introduce yourself better than I can. So Yoav, we'll start with you. I want to give a little bit of your background and your relationship with account abstraction and why you think it's so important. Well, I think, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Uh, I think account, account abstraction is something that we must have. Uh, both for some technical reasons, such as abstracting uh, signatures for a future quantum resistance, but uh, more importantly, for, a, for usability. If you want, the, um, uh, I mean, if, if you want to really uh, go bankless, uh, then uh, you, need to get, uh, you, need, you need to get to a usability where the user never sees a private key, the user never sees a seed phrase, so that... Uh, uh, so that uh, my mother can uh, can use it, and if she loses access to it, she way, she has a way to recover. And uh, and uh, you need to have uh, different security policies in the account, uh, such, such as, uh, for example, you wouldn't expect your bank account to be the same if you are a large corporation or an individual uh, customer. Maybe you want to have some uh, different spending policies. So all of these things become possible. Anything that a bank, a bank account can do for you and more can be, done, uh, can be done using account abstraction. I think this is a must for uh, UX purposes. Certainly. And uh, going down the line, of course, we have uh, Julian from Argent. Uh, Julian, can you explain a little bit about what Argent is for those who aren't familiar and, and how it relates to account abstraction? Uh, so Arjun, it's a smart contract. You know, we're a company. We've been building smart contract-based wallet uh, since 2018. And basically, we started on a mission to actually solve exactly what account abstraction is trying to solve, recognizing that the user experience of VOAs will basically never scale. And so if we keep that paradigm, I think we'll, we'll remain in the bubble that we are in, but we'll be unable to reach the next you know, 100 million users or billion of users because the, the user experience of self custody is too complicated. And so we started building Argent based on, you know, to try to fix that. And we did that at the application layer on Ethereum, so trying to to build a smart contract-based wallet, enabling different security flows to actually fix the issues that, that you have mentioned. So for example, we introduced social recovery, which is a way to get rid of seed phrase. We introduced some kind of fraud monitoring and so on. Uh, that has been a great experience, but of course, we build that at the application layer, meaning that smart contract wallet are second-class citizen, because the entire ecosystem is still built around this paradigm of VOAs. I mean, the developers, the tooling, everybody is thinking in terms of VOAs, which means that there's some <coughs> compatibility issues if you're a smart contract wallet. We, we like to say that we've been second class citizen. And so of course the goal of account abstraction is to make smart contract based wallet first class citizen. And of course that gets us very, very excited. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I've got a special question for you, uh, but also uh, feel free to introduce yourself and, and tell us what you do at Geth. But also could you, after you do that, Explain, why do we call it account abstraction? What are we abstracting? Why is the abstracting word here? Uh, just to really get things at the very basement level. Sure, so I recently joined the Geth team actually, so I'm kind of like looking for my home amongst the Geth team. I think that there's many different things that the Geth team has focuses on, and so I'm trying to find like where my very specific focus will end up being. So <clears throat> before that, I was part of this team called Quilt, and we did a lot of research and development on future ideas in Ethereum. And the first place that I became involved with account abstraction was back in the earlier days when we called 
the beacon chain ETH2, and we talked about the different phases of the ETH2 deployments. And so the Quilt team was working on phase two for ETH2 for a while, and we were trying to think about how to define uh, execution environments in a way that you could abstractly define all of the execution semantics about the virtual machine that was executing on Ethereum. And of course, like one of those things that you needed to define abstractly was like the account logic. And so this is where we first started running into this problem that like Vitalik had already talked about in re re the relation to the EVM like earlier on in 2016 and so. And so I guess for me, the, the, the meaning of account abstraction is actually you know, maybe uh, not the perfect way of, of defining like what account abstraction actually is. It's a term that has like many meanings for many different people. And for me, whenever I understand account abstraction, I think of it more as like validation abstraction. I think of it like we're trying to abstract what it means to validate an account in Ethereum. And so today, if you want to validate a transaction in Ethereum, you're going to recover some address from uh, a signature, look at that address in the state to determine if the nonce is uh, okay for the transaction that's been sent and that the account has enough balance. And so that's one way of validating a transaction. But there's many different ways. You could have a multi-signature. You could use different cryptographic primitives to, to validate a transaction. And so when I think of account abstraction, that's what I first and foremost think about. Mm -hmm. But I also understand account abstraction is you know, used more generally now to think about smart contract wallets and how can we add more functionality uh, t you know, to the protocol or, or give users a better user experience when they're interacting with the protocol. Mm -hmm. And so now I understand that there's like many ways of like thinking about it. Uh, Vitalik, every time you introduce yourself, you always come up with a new, funny, different way of, of doing it depending on what era of Ethereum you are. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself and how you relate to Ethereum these days and also answer the question for you. Why does everyone say that account abstraction is inevitable? Yeah, yeah. So, hi, guys. I'm Vitalik. I'm uh, a uh, fashion influencer and travel blogger at the <laughs> Ethereum Foundation. Um, yeah, so account abstraction has been a uh, topic I've been uh, like really trying to push for um, almost uh, since the beginning, right? Like, I uh, think even uh, actually yeah, when Ethereum launched, the uh, original vision I had been hoping for was to try to get people to use smart contract wallets by default, right? Because I mean, we wanted people's money to be secure, and we thought it would be really nice if people could just have the default type of account be a yeah, two of three yeah, multi-sig wallet, right? And uh, the, that ended up not happening, I think, uh, in part because uh, the community was just I mean, was so fed up by yeah, incessant kind of delays on top of delays for the yeah, Ethereum 1.0 launch that at some point we just put our foot down and said, okay, you know, no more features. Unfortunately, we have to just like cut everything and launch something. Um, but then, you know, since then we've been uh, trying uh, very hard to like, come up with uh, the right way to actually uh, get to the point where smart contract wallets can be the uh, default uh, type of wallet that people can use and try to get all these benefits like, uh, you know, security from multi-sigs, um, you know, a social recovery, um, other types of cryptography, um, if uh, you want quantum resistance. Um, more recently, yeah, you know, thanks to, you know, you, uh, you know, you have and you the others, uh, the, uh, the topic of kind of trying to get uh, layer, uh, aggregation uh, to be yeah, in here in there as well to try to kind of save gas and uh, save data. Um, so, like, tr basically trying to find the way to bring uh, smart contract wallets in uh, and make them actually be as convenient and have all of the properties. Um, censorship resistance is another important property um, that. Um, E externally owned accounts, so, so the default type of accounts that most people use uh, to, uh, use now um, have today. And you know, it turns out that there's uh, actually quite uh, you know, a bunch of challenges, and uh, there have been a whole bunch of various efforts. Um, you know, there was like EIP, I think it was 86, and then 210, and then 2938, and then you know, there's. Uh, a kind of grab bag of uh, different proposals. Um, se separately, the yeah, kind of uh, separately the the strand of uh, kind of enabling a, a kind of a d delegation, um, I th which is uh, basically allowing people to pay for transactions on behalf of other people, which I think is part of the yeah, motivation of like both uh, th 3074 and uh, some uh, other proposals. Like, like a th that's been you know, basically there's been this you know really long strand of research of trying to like really yeah optimize and figure out like what is the cleanest and like what is the most sensible and secure design uh, to get to um, you know what uh, actually satisfying these goals and you know that's what we're, we're trying to implement and uh, roll out today.
I want you to uh, check my understanding on this because I actually had to do uh, some homework to prepare for this, mo this panel because this is uh, technically challenging for me. The, after kind of figuring out, when people explain account abstraction, they were like, oh, it enables you to do this and then it unlocks this feature and it lets us do that. Uh, but it kind of feels like we're feeling uh, th that ele elephant metaphor where somebody's feeling the tail and it's like a snake and somebody's feeling the leg. It's like, oh, it's like a tree without actually seeing the whole thing. Uh, so I want you to check, check this metaphor with me. Um, an externally owned account. There's only two types of accounts on Ethereum. You have an externally owned account, which is probably what you use when you like, buy your NFTs. So you have a, a, a private key and it unlocks a wallet. And then there's a smart contract. Uh, and account abstraction is putting what we currently use, which is you know, our ledger or our private keys that unlocks a specific wallet, and it makes our, that wallet a smart contract, which is more programmable. My mental model for this is that um, a smart a account abstraction is like putting a chip into a wallet. And what I mean by that is that we have like Bitcoin, which the meme is like Bitcoin is a calculator, Ethereum is a smartphone. And I kind of apply that to externally owned accounts and uh, a smart contract wallets or account abstraction wallets where ex externally owned accounts are like Bitcoin, they don't really do too much. Uh, and then uh, externally, uh, and then uh, account extraction wallets are like uh, Ethereum where there's a chip in it. Is, is that metaphor land? Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a really fun metaphor, I like it. Is there anything incomplete about that? And, and Matt, I want to throw this one to you, uh, where you were talking about um, abs uh, validation abstraction. Can you connect these two metaphors? How, how do those things relate? Right. So I think, you know, if you're thinking of the, con the concept of like putting a chip into a wallet, there's like two important pieces that the wallet is doing. And the way that I think about it is that the chip is dealing with the validation logic. Like I mentioned when I spoke a minute ago, uh, it's determining like is this uh, message and signature that's coming from account valid in the context of this account. Uh, you could also imagine the chip did other things. Uh, after you do the validation, you would have like the execution portion. And so a lot of times when we think about account abstraction as like a general concept, we also think it's doing a lot of other stuff now. And so that chip is now determining like I want to send a bunch of transactions from this account all, or I want to send a bunch of calls from this transaction or from this account all in one transaction or I want to recover uh, using like some social recovery group that I've come up with. So that's like another part of the chip. Beautiful, beautiful. And I want to throw this one to, to Julian as somebody who's responsible for actually putting some smart contract wallets in people's hands. Thank you for your service. Uh, how do you think this is going to get rolled out? Uh, people generally, and we'll get into the topic as to why people think that everyone will have a, a, a smart contract wallet rather than externally owned account in the future. But what's, what's, like, what's your idea for how this gets rolled out into how do we replace private keys with externally owned, uh, with account extracted wallets? So that's, that's a very good question. I think the, the way I see it is that I think, I mean, Vitalik has been pushing for account abstraction <clears throat> for a long time. And every single proposal has some, you know, enabled some of the features of account abstraction, but none of them, I think, is the end game. Uh, and, and personally, for example, I like the last proposal, 4337, but the problem is that it's still it's at the application layer. So we are not fixing what I think is the real problem, is getting rid of, of EOAs. And I understand that on Ethereum, there's so much at stake that such a drastic change will take time. I think people are recognizing that account abstraction is the future. I think it will happen. But on Ethereum, I think it will take time. What we've been pushing at Argen is that I think now we are seeing the emergence of layer twos. And I think layer twos are an amazing opportunity to actually try to test some of these, you know, and try to fix some of these limitations of, of the EVM that, on L, that we have on L1 because they have much less at stake. And then each layer twos, they, they may favor a different type of trade-off. So we can explore on different pattern uh, and, and actually bring account abstraction at the, at, at the layer twos right now. So this is what we are pushing. And that will enable us to better understand you know, the limitations, what we can do. And, and following that, I think then we'll have everything in hands to actually bring that to layer one and push for account abstraction at really the protocol level on layer one. Th that's the way I see the roadmap of account abstraction unfolding. Beautiful. And, and Yoav, you're a security reacher at, at EF, so I want to tap into your security mind. Why are smart contract wallets more secure? Like what security benefits from a user perspective or whoever might else, what other entity might also use uh, a smart contract wallet? Why, why is it more secure than our, our current wallets? Well, then, uh, this, uh, there are many different ways in, in which it makes you more secure. First of all is a key management. Users, uh, users don't know how to manage keys, even expert users. And uh, just, uh, I think that five years from now, if we, we recall that we used to secure our assets by writing uh, 12 words on a piece of paper, it will seem unreal to us. 
So I think, uh, for example, being able to add devices, uh, to add devices to your wallet, so the wallet is no longer associated with uh, some seed phrase, you never actually see it, but instead uh, you add your phone, you add your computer, then if you lose your phone, you remove it and add a new one using your computer. So, um, and so this allows, this uh, obviously imp improves the security because you don't need to manage keys. And then there's the, uh, uh, there are things like, uh, for example, you could say that uh, your wallet is, uh, that uh, you, can, you can have good usability and spend small amounts easily using your phone, but if you are doing something uh, uh, out of the ordinary, such as sending a very large amount, um, in that case, uh, in that case, you have to go get your ledger or something. You, add, you have to add another signature. So it allows you to have uh, security policies uh, to protect yourself. And there's the, there are the security benefits of switching, uh, of switching to a better signature scheme, which uh, we're going to have to do in the future anyway. Um, and since, since it's programmable, you can add any, like, any security mechanism you come up with. And different users will have different, uh, will have, uh, different requirements. So having just a single security policy for accounts, which is what we have with EOAs, I mean, the security policy for, for an EOA is uh, if you have the key, do anything. If you don't have the key, do nothing. This is not granular enough. So I think being able to have, a, to have personalized security policies will make Ethereum overall more secure. And I, I think um, the way that I see account abstracted wallets, smart contract wallets, there's this unique relationship with devices. And we, we all have a bajillion devices in our homes. Uh, like when I set up my computer, I have my computer in front of me, I got my phone, and then maybe there's an iPad, and those are three devices each with different levels of security assumptions around them. Like, my computer is at home. It doesn't go anywhere. My mobile phone can go anywhere in the world. But all of these things, can you talk about the relationship between a device and the wallet and how that can um, relate to a different level of security of, of control of access, right? So maybe I only want to send $100 with my phone, but I can send all of my money with my computer. Can you talk about the relationship with a device and a, and a smart contract wallet? Yes, this, uh, this should definitely be a part of the security policy for your wallet. Um, so yes, you could say that uh, you can use your phone to do small things, but your computer for, uh, uh, for bigger things. I'm actually not sure. Uh, I'm, sometimes your phone could actually be more secure because uh, uh, on your computer may or may not have uh, the capability of, secu of, uh, of uh, secure enclaves, but uh, phones, uh, modern phones uh, usually do. Um, now, the problem is that uh, at the moment you couldn't use it with an EOA because it doesn't support the signatures that uh, Ethereum uses. It doesn't support the same uh, curve. But um, with account abstraction, it becomes, uh, it becomes possible, and someone actually uh, just built, uh, built a nice demo of such wallet uh, at the hackathon here in Bogota. So, um, you can have a, so if you can associate a fingerprint of a specific device, I mean you, can, you can have a fingerprint on your device, which is actually verified by a secure enclave on your phone, and then the signature happens inside it. So your phone actually gives you a pretty good, uh, pretty good security. But uh, in any case, you have to evaluate that, uh, for example, your phone is coming with you, your computer stays at home. So you have to evaluate that your unique situation and set up a policy where uh, you decide which device can do what, and maybe sometimes you need uh, to use two of the devices. Maybe sometimes you need to go also get your ledger from the safe. So it's up to you to, say, to decide how each device is going to be used in your wallet. I think the important, important thing to take uh, note from here is that we're using devices to relate to a wallet differently rather than having a different wallet on every single device. Uh, and so, Julian, I want to throw this one to you and how you guys are thinking this at, at Argent uh, and, and check my understanding here. It's like, uh, I've, got, I've got a wallet here on my phone. I've got a wallet on my, my MetaMask on my computer. I've got a wallet on my ledger. There's three different wallets. Um, but now we're talking about three different ways of interfacing with the same wallet, uh, which is a different, different kind of just organizational structure. So do you think that, like, we're just going to be able to kill most of the wallets, all these like throwaway wallets that we use, and instead of like having a little bit of cash in some wallet and a medium amount of cash in another wallet, and then like cold storage, it's actually going to be the same wallet, and we just have different levels of security of how to access these things. How are you designing Argent to uh, to work inside of this paradigm? I think the first thing for me and the beauty of account abstraction is that you can choose as a user. So I don't think there's one model that fits for anyone. 
there are users that may want to have different accounts for privacy reasons, for example. So I think there's not one model that, that fits all. But of course, in, in terms of Argent, we like to see the Argent wallet, the, the main account, if you want, at, at, as your identity on chain. And so, yes, having the ability to choose the security associated to the key that, that's in a, a different device is, of course, very, very important. And so at Argent, we are researching a, a lot of different ideas. For example, now we're exploring something called session keys. Is the idea to have uh, an ephemeral keys to which you can attach very strict policies. So you can literally say this key is valid for 24 hours and it can only call a certain method on a certain, certain contract. And so you can imagine, for example, if you consider that your phone is more secure, because I agree with you, Af, I think my phone is more secure than my laptop, but maybe I can actually have a, a key on my laptop that has restricted policies. And so that key, yes, can do certain action, but I define exactly the type of actions and, and the rules that are associated to, to that key. Uh, but to answer your question, for me, it's really about giving the choice to users. And I think that's, again, the beauty of account abstraction is that it opens a completely new design space for what an account can be. And I think we are only scratching the surface of, of what can be done. At Argent, we see it as, as your identity. It's, it's your core account. You may have multiple accounts with, with different rules. For example, it's, it's a good example. If I'm playing an on-chain game, I may not want to play an on-chain game on which I have, say, $50 in a certain token. I don't want to play that game with the same account on which I have all my savings, for example. So I think having the ability to have different accounts with different rules and different logic is actually what account abstraction brings. Yeah. I, I think uh, I, ju I just wanted to add that uh, for, uh, even if for privacy reasons, you want to have multiple wallets because you don't want to dox yourself everywhere. Uh, it's still uh, the, the fact that we decouple the, we decouple the device and uh, the keys from the wallets means that you can have all of them associated with a fingerprint on your same uh, phone. So you choose which one you're using based on whatever privacy uh, you want to have, but you still use the same device. You don't need a different device for each wallet. I want to turn this conversation to how we actually get account abstraction implemented at the layer one, because this is going to take a, uh, an EIP. This is going to take a hard fork to get this into Ethereum. Uh, and I want to throw this one to Vitalik, our resident crypto philosopher here. Uh, crypto loves tribes. We got like the layer one tribes, we got the layer two tribes. Are there like uh, account abstraction tribes? And if there are, what do they fight over? I mean, I, I kind of feel like the tribeness of account abstraction is like a bit overstated in that I don't like, I don't really see many competing camps of approaches for like, let's say, how to solve the problem of uh, I have a smart contract wallet and I want to be able to send things from that smart contract wallet uh, without needing you know, some third party to wrap my transaction and pay 21,000 gas overhead or whatever, right? But there's uh, the different camps I think are more kind of just groups of people that came into the space of uh, improving accounts with uh, different emphases, right? So like, the, like, the, the emphasis that I came with is uh, solving the, yep, the, the problem of like, how to make it easier for people to have smart contract wallets with arbitrary validation. Other people came in with the uh, emphasis of uh, solving the yeah, problem of uh, how to let people pay for other people's accounts or how to let someone who has USDC only pay yeah, their fees in USDC instead of paying fees in ETH. Um, there, so, and then uh, you know, there's also the yeah, problem of uh, how to let an account do many operations in one transaction. And though these are not really, yeah, they're not competing goals, right? I think they're goals that like everyone here agrees that we need a yeah, solution that covers all of them, right? And I think uh, you know, there's uh, you know, different ideas that are slowly kind of conver converging toward. Um, some architecture that can that actually does um, kind of do it, is getting better and better at actually fitting together. Um, and in terms of like how to get from here to there, like one of the yeah, differences between um, EIP two nine three eight and ERC four three three seven, right, is that four three three seven is an ERC, it's twenty nine three eight is an EIP. And twenty nine three eight is a kind of boil the ocean, let's change the protocol now, and like let's um, you know set things right in the protocol sort of solution. 4337 is an extra protocol solution, right? And it's uh, kind of uh, analogous to sort of the roll-up centric roadmap in some way, right? Which is, um, you know, part of, part of the motivation there is like the core, de core developers are busy, you know, there's the merge and there's the surge and there's the splurge and the purge. And, uh, you know, some people wants to call single slot finality the George. Um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, and then, you know, 
because uh, 4337 is an ERC, we can kind of work on it separately, get it in, uh, you know, have a small amount of usage, uh, start fairly quickly, get it into L2s, and uh, improve it from there, um, from there over time. But I guess the, the, the one kind of big difference here is that I think uh, over time, like especially over the last year, there has been this realization that like we do want EIPs, like as in things that hard fork change the Ethereum protocol eventually, because like we do want to upgrade existing EOAs, uh, like we want to let existing users that don't want to, you know, go through the, the expense of just completely moving everything from their current account, uh, to, like we want to let them enjoy the benefits of the again, new system. And uh, we might, you know, we want benefits like, say, uh, you know, censor any censorship resistance guarantees that we get from inclusion lists. So, like, we want that to apply to account abstracted operations. And, uh, you know, if we want these uh, different things to uh, or, like happen, then that does require making uh, protocol changes, right? But the, uh, the good news is that kind of the ERC comes first and the uh, EIPs come later and there's a lot of these uh, kind of great proposals for how to do these, uh, e these EIPs and like there is definitely a kind of a deep um, multi-year, multi-stage roadmap involved where like it's, you know, starts off in a kind of making it friendly for the uh, people that kind of wants to pioneer and, and um, you know, really care about getting these properties um, early and then and, you know, expanding more and more until finally, um, you know, EOAs may, may actually, uh, you know, finally kind of go away and we really do just have smart contract wallets and all the benefits are available for everyone. So if I'm understanding correctly, like the current state of account abstraction development is that we haven't yet come to consensus as to what the EIP that we want to put into the Ethereum base layer is. Like, we know EIP 1559, we totally wanted that. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is an equivalent EIP for account abstraction that Indeed. we have. There, there is an ERC, and to be clear, right, it's important to remember that, like, with just the ERC, we can already get to the point where, you know, if people want to, like, replace their entire activity and, like, run it off of, of account abstracted wallets instead of regular ones, like, they can do it and it works reasonably well, right? Uh, but, but the EIP is for the second stage of the roadmap, indeed. Like, there are, like, we didn't, there's, uh, we do not have those EIPs yet. They're under development. There's um, lots of different, there, there's lots of different, uh, uh, different ideas and it's still solidifying. If I can add to that, I think, I was, I was saying some layer twos are actually experimenting on that. For example, if you look at StarkNet and ZK Sync, they are launching with native account abstraction, which is actually inspired by ERC4337. So even if it's just an ERC for now Ethereum, it's actually in, inspiring layer twos that can actually try to implement the next step, which I think will come in a later EIP when we will change that at the protocol level on, on layer one. But I think it's in, interesting to realize that it's already there on certain layer twos. If you look at StarkNet, it's still in alpha, but actually it launched with native account abstraction, so there's no more ERAs. It's actually trying to be the end goal. And I think that we learn a lot on the StarkNet ecosystem that we can then bring back to the next EIP that will put hopefully 4337 to the one layer down to the protocol level. Yeah. If it's okay if for me to just make a comment on this, I think that this idea of layer twos experimenting with future potential core changes to the Ethereum protocol is really interesting. And I think things like StarkNet is a very interesting place for it to happen because it's very different than what the EVM actually looks like. And I think it's probably the right place for those things to happen. But I'm still hesitant about understanding how this is going to play out across all of the different layer twos. Because we've seen over the last 18 months, there's been a huge push for things like EVM equivalents and having something that's exactly like Ethereum and trying to bring things like 4337 into the protocol, I'm not sure how it's going to play out on those different types of systems. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. But I mean, we're discussing with some of the team, like, like Arbitrum Optimism, who, who want to have that EVM equivalence, but they all recognize that they'll also need to have account abstraction at some yeah. point. And so they want to capture the EVM ecosystem, but at the same time, they would want to have account abstraction. And so that, that conversation is on right now. And, and hopefully we can find a path to make that happen on, on these, you know, these, these layer twos that want to be as close as possible to EVM equivalents. You have ZK Sync V2, for example, that wants to be EVM equivalent, but also wants to have account abstraction. Mm -hmm. So I think even if you're going for the EVM equivalents, I think it's good to try to push the, EV, I mean, modify the EVM a little bit so that you can still capture that, that compatibility and the fact that you have a common standard with different layer twos, but still try to fix some of these issues if you can. So I think this conversation is on right now. There's no clear path yet, for sure. Uh, but I do think it will probably happen on layer twos before it will happen on layer ones. 
Yeah, I mean, one way to look at like how much equivalence you need is kind of from the yeah, point of view of the user, right? So, uh, like, I have you know my Ethereum wallet like zero x d eight d a blah blah blah, and uh, one of the nice things that um, the uh, EOAs offer is that like one with just the same wallet, the same code, the same key scheme, the same everything, I can just you know switch to Optimism and with the same send a transaction on Optimism, switch to Arbitrum, send a transaction on Arbitrum, and, and so forth, right? The yeah, other benefit is that I get the exact same address. Like you can go and send things to zero x d a d a blah blah on Optimism, and I'm gonna have them, right? Or you could send things to zero x d a d a blah blah on Arbitrum, and I'm gonna have them, right? And EIP 4337, like, you know, it does try hard to make that possible, right? Like, it definitely makes it possible to, uh, you know, use the same, con the, the same code and have the same type of contract wallet on all, on all of these rollups. And because the uh, singleton is created with create2, um, it's going to, the singleton's going to have the same address on all the rollups. And so you're going to be able to, uh, like, anything derived from the singleton, including people, like, people's individual wallets, are also going to uh, kind of have the same addresses, right? So, like, one, one thing that, you know, like people, you know, ZK, Starknet, and similar systems could do is, like, try to achieve kind of, like, that code and address equivalence, for example, you know, even while experimenting with trying to, like, make the way they handle operations much cleaner and different. And just to, I want to go back to what Matt was saying and just to really drive this point home about how layer twos are going to be like the testing bed for uh, account abstraction. Matt, can you just kind of walk us through into the future about how you think this may play out? Like ZK Sync does some sor sort of flavor of account abstraction, Starknet does a different one, the market decides what they like, we sort of come to consensus as to what features should be pushed down to the layer one. How, how is this going to work out in the future? I mean, honestly, I'm just really curious to see how it plays out in the future. I think. You know, my perspective is I'm very worried about fragmentation of different approaches. And I think if we think about maybe on the lo like longer uh, time scales, 10 years maybe, eventually we'll come to some solution that's great and everybody will do it just because all of the other, uh, the, you know, all of the other companies will have, have run out of money and, you know, left the ecosystem. <laughs> but I think I'm very worried about the, like, shorter term, like three to five years. Like, how, how are we going to be able to bring millions of people into this ecosystem and have, like, really good experiences using applications if every single protocol has a different way of doing account abstraction? I can't imagine trying to support, like, ten different ways of doing account abstraction in Ethers JS or Web3.js. And so that's kind of, like, my perspective is, like, how can we do this in a way that we avoid the fragmentation? And that's why my perspective is that we should really consider using the EVM on the Ethereum mainnet as the shelling point for coordination amongst all of these different protocols. Is there going to become a moment where at some point this turns from like, oh, we'll, we'll talk about account abstraction and we'll ideate on it to like, oh, we need to pull the fire alarm and ship this thing. Is, that, is there like a fire alarm uh, event potential in the future where like we need to get this done? Mm, starting to ship already. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, we've had Gnosis safes for a long time as well. So, the, you know, smart contract wallets have existed. We want to, like, improve the experience of using them. And I wanted to say, like, earlier, like, I think it's really cool understanding all the different uh, security perspectives of account abstraction and the different policies of different devices. But the way that I think about it a lot more is how can we improve the user experience of using Ethereum? And that's something that I think, like, we're still really lagging behind. And to me, the reason that we're lagging behind is because there is fragmentation across different wallets, different protocols. From my point of view, I do see some kind of, of urgency because I, and for me, it relates to self-custody. I think self-custody today, because of EOAs, is really hard. We all know that. And because of that, a lot of people are actually turning to centralized solution. I mean, if we ask the audience, most of us here, we have a Binance or an FTX or a Coinbase account, even though we are the builders and, and the early adopters. So my fear is that if we don't find a way to, to, to have a good user experience for self-custody, then my fear is that the next wave of users may turn more and more to centralized solution, and then we will fail as an ecosystem. And in my opinion, account abstraction is actually the only way to, to enable this user experience that can bake self-custody, but still make it simple for user. So I do feel a certain sense of urgency. Yeah. That's a good point. And I feel like for me, the urgency is like, how do we make smart contract walls the default everywhere? Because defaults are sticky. And so if I go to mint an NFT on OpenSea and I create a MetaMask following some tutorial, that's the default that I'm stuck with for a long time. It's very hard for me to migrate to the smart contract world. And so 
figuring out how to make that the first thing that people see whenever they come onto all of the different protocols is very, very important. Yeah, fully agree. Um, okay, so uh, to my knowledge, the current state of DeFi is unfriendly to account abstraction and smart contract wallets. Can one of you guys explain why that's the case? Uh, why is that the case and how do we fix it? Yeah. So I wouldn't say that DeFi in general is, uh, is not friendly. There are some dApps that are, that are some dApps that uh, make it difficult. For example, uh, <coughs> um, for, for example uh, they assume that you can sign directly with the address. So, and contracts cannot sign. Contracts do not have a private key. So uh, if you need to log in, for example, to OpenSea by using, uh, uh, if, if you need to log in by signing a message with your address, then you're unable to log in. And we have an ERC to solve that, a very old one actually, uh, 1271, which defines uh, how a contract can uh, validate it, uh, can say is signature valid. So some dApps support it, some don't and assume an EOA. We need app developers to stop, uh, to stop doing this uh, sort of thing and assume that, uh, some of the, uh, that some of the addresses are actually contracts. Uh, that's the, that's like the minimum requirement in order to make it a first class citizen. So I want to run through some potential use cases just to um, make things really concrete in the imagination of, of the people in the audience here and the listeners. Uh, so I want you to, each of you to think of the most powerful use case that account abstraction unlocks and how that onboards new people, new utility into Ethereum. You each get one, uh, and if whoever is going to go first is going to have the, the opportunity to have the best one. Yo, I'm going to give it to you. What's the, what's the best use case that account abstraction unlocks? Well, <laughs> you know, there are, uh, there are uh, millions of use cases, some of them quite exotic. Uh, I'm tempted to talk about them, but instead I'll just repeat that, uh, uh, being, able, that uh, being able to abstract the signature and to have, uh, as, uh, to have uh, authentication and authorization uh, abstracted and uh, let the user control it, that's the single most important thing uh, in my opinion. I think uh, just to make the concept of uh, abstraction more concrete for people, right? Like one of, one of the big use cases is uh, multi-sig wallets and uh, social recovery wallets, right? So multi-sig wallets, pretty simple. You know, you have n keys and you need you know some n over two or some number of them. So like for example, you have uh, you know six keys and you need four of them in order to sign a transaction, right? Like that's uh, like most of my money is in a four of six agnosis safe, right? And like the you know it's it's public info. It's on Etherscan, <laughs> but. Um, then the social recovery wallet is like a wallet where you can um, sign things uh, with uh, and send transactions with one key, but if you lose your key, then there is um, you know some other mechanism which itself probably could be a multi-sig, right? So uh, the yeah, like one thing you could do is like you know choose um, like five friends and three and uh, three of them can. Uh, uh, can kind of make it up, and uh, that mechanism can uh, change the uh, key of your account if you lose it, right? So the philosophy there is like, in practice, people's accounts getting lost is a big, it happens much more often, it's a bigger problem than accounts getting stolen, and so, you know, you can solve that problem without sacrificing any convenience, and that makes sense for, uh, you know, a lot of uh, smaller and uh, medium uh, value use cases, right? So the challenge, though, is that uh, you know if you want the benefits of uh, either the like the, the security, the protection against theft, and like the, the kind of you know the really hardcore uh, security of uh, multi-sig wallets, or the yeah, easier recovery of uh, social recovery wallets, you have to put your funds into a smart contract wallet, right? And uh, smart contracts exist, and like you can do this today. But the problem is that if you want to actually send a transaction, then like you have to also have money in an EOA, and the EOA has to pay gas, or you know. You have to work through an intermediary, and then you have to rely on that intermediary, and then what if, what if that intermediary starts censoring, and that, or or even just you know disappears or whatever, and uh, it, you know that you end up wasting gas, and there's just like a lot of extra complexity involved, which is I mean what, what basically yeah, you know what we're trying to get rid of here, right? So I think like, you know multi sigs and social recoveries are one easy. Yeah, use case of abstraction, but then another one is uh, being quantum proof, right? Like uh, when quantum computers come, we, uh, we all have to like, get, move, get out of uh, ECDSA entirely. And, uh, is there a timeline on that? Unknown. Um. Uh, it's uh, unknown, yeah. but, uh, but, what's, uh, but uh, what's great about uh, our current process, even with the ELC, is that we can start moving away from it. We don't have to do it uh, one day. We can, uh, mm -hmm. we can start moving uh, gradually. 
And over time, you'll see less and less wallets relying on, uh, relying on ECDSA. So we can start uh, moving there. It's not a one-day uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Matt, uh, any utilities that Vitalik and Yoav didn't mention that come to mind about account abstraction? Batch transactions. Mm. Why, why is that such a big deal? Why do we need that? Have you ever used the blockchain? <laughs> <laughs> A few times I've been known, yeah. Uh, what, 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 can you uh, do a, give us a user story about like, how this is a UX improvement? As a good core developer, I don't use the blockchain very often, but when I do use the blockchain, I have to sign so many messages to send anything. I have to prove my tokens to go to a contract. I have to send them, then I have to prove more tokens to go to a different contract, all for the same application. And to me, it's like we could be making this all a single message to go on chain. So you're saying that account abstraction uh, allows us to uh, produce the UX that people kind of expect there to be in the long term that we don't have today, more or less. I don't think it's just account abstraction. Like I think that we could be ha living in this world today. What I would really like to see is like some sort of mechanism for dApps to let the wallet know that I would like to send a batch of operations and the wallet can determine whether or not it has the capability of sending those in an atomic batch. And so like, I would imagine that you, know, you go to Uniswap and you need to approve and then uh, do a swap. Rather than having that pop up as two dialogues, if you have MetaMask, it could show and say, I want you to sign two different transactions to do these two things to complete the operation that you would want. And MetaMask would send out those two transactions and verify that they both happen. If you have a Gnosis Safe or an Argin wallet, it would get that message and it would say, I want you to do two operations, but you have the ability to send them all in one transaction. So now you just sign one transaction and send that off. That's something that we could just have today that I think we're totally missing. And, and actually a good example of that in practice is on the Stagnet ecosystem, there's a like NFT marketplace. And, and there they've introduced the concept of a shopping cart. So when you go, you can actually do your shopping in a sense. You want to buy that NFT, that one, that one, and you will pay, pay different token. And at the end of your session, you go to your shopping cart, you say, buy these items now. And your smart contract will like orchestrate all these operations. So it will do all the approve on the ERC20 token that are needed and then purchase all these NFTs. So, so exactly, this is, I think the multi-code is, is a great example. So social recovery is another great example, so I come last. But I still think something that I find very interesting is the idea of off-road monitoring. Because I think the problem with the blockchain is that, I mean, we make users or there are bad actors and it's sometimes very complicated to know exactly what you are doing as a transaction. Typically, you'll see some, you know, some cold data or something that is very obscure, and it, it's very complicated for us as a human to actually you know, know the, the, the actions that, that we are making. And with a smart contract or account abstraction, you can imagine, for example, that you, you, you program a second key on your account that must co-sign every transaction. So you turn your account in a two of two multisig. But then you can choose to give that key to a service that may monitor the operation that you are about to do. And so that service, if it detects that the call data is legit, it's something that you know, is secure, it can co-sign automatically, it's transparent to the user. But now you're making a large transfer to an address that you've never interacted with, maybe it can just ask you to confirm who you are with a second factor, like email and SMS or Google Auto or something. So using account abstraction, we can actually bring the flows that user, normal users are expecting, you know, bring the best of Web2 or of the banking world, but actually reproduce that purely on-chain. So I think, yeah, for me, it's really multi core social recovery and, and, and fraud monitoring are three ways that we can greatly improve the, the user experience for users, yeah. One thing I'm still uncertain of is, is how we, we want everyone to have a smart contract wallet. We assume that everyone will eventually have a smart contract wallet, as everyone that's in this room, and also all future users of Ethereum. How does that actually happen? As in, who are the service providers? We have somebody like Argent, who's producing a smart contract wallet, uh, but what are the other categories of how smart contract wallets get into the hands of users. Uh, like, I could imagine, for example, like I'm logging into a, some Web3 game, and I need to use a wallet for that. Where does that wallet come from? Who, who provides that wallet? And uh, maybe, maybe that's what Gnosis Safe is, but maybe not. Like, what are the c categories of who's providing all of these wallet, uh, wallets to us, all the users? Like, are there different categories out there? I think um, my philosophy on this is that like, one of the yeah, really strong ideas here is that we want to be as a kind of active intermediary minimized as possible, right? To the point of like basically, you know, in an ideal world, not requiring any active intermediaries that uh, don't uh, already exist in uh, EOA land, right? Um, so the, uh, like, you know, there are people, 
there are kind of, inter, you know, act once and that um, intermediary is what that could, you know, do their thing and then disappear, which are, you know, smart contract wallet authors, wallet developers, and that people like that. But, like, we don't want to have to depend on, you know, like active a kind of relaying actors of some kind, for example, right? Which is, um, you know, the, the, like the status quo is that you do need a, yeah, like you do need to talk to a specific relaying actor if you want a, yeah, you know, if you don't have your own um, EOA and you want to use a yeah, transaction through a yeah, smart contract wallet, right? And I think, uh, you know, censorship resistance is a good reason to minimize active intermediaries, just kind of simplicity. But it's like, it takes a while to get there, right? So ERC-4337, it works through an MEV ecosystem, so it kind of acts, makes, it, it relies on uh, builders to act as intermediaries, and then, you know, the goal of uh, the, uh, the various kind of longer term EIPs is to kind of constrict that more and, and sort of protocolize that um, more and more over time. So we are, oh we have five minutes. We're gonna try and find t some time for questions. So if you have questions, start thinking of them now. But um, as we wrap this up, I want to do some call to actions. Uh, and there's a ver various different like uh, stakeholders in, this, uh, in the world of account abstraction. We got core devs, application devs, layer two teams, and users. Each of these people have their own sort of responsibility for getting uh, account abstraction out into the world. Um, so uh, let's start with the core devs. What do the core devs need to do to get account abstraction done? What do they need to pay attention to? Vitalik, I'll throw that one to you. L1 core devs, not, I would say yeah, not much yet. Okay. Um, L2 core devs, I think, um, are, are uh, important for them to be yeah, kind of on the ball earlier because I think uh, L2, there's a lot of reasons why L2s are a yeah, very natural uh, kind of uh, testing ground for account abstraction. I mean, first, uh, because uh, layered, Look, there's just lower fees on layer twos um, and uh, lower two fees, especially for computation, right? So the yeah, overhead of um, account abstraction matters less. Uh, they can uh, iterate and they can uh, uh, develop and build a lot of things more quickly. Um, also, one thing we didn't touch on in this panel yet is that um, EAP for, or ERC-4337 has this some um, aggregation feature in it, which allows uh, basically different uh, signatures of uh, different transactions to get aggregated together into one. It's the... Uh, same sort of stuff as the aggregation uh, technology that uh, powers the, uh, if it, the uh, Ethereum beacon chain and that allows so many validators to uh, make their attestations and for those attestations to be uh, kind of packaged together into one little thing that can be verified very quickly. And uh, that's, like, that's super important on layer two, is, right? Because on layer two is computation, is, or data is even more expensive than computation and aggregation like really uh, saves on data, right? Um, so for those reasons, uh, like layer two are an even more natural kind of first use case for um, um, abstraction than uh, layer ones. And uh, there's a lot that layer twos can do, right? Like layer twos run, you know, they run sequencers and they're in the process of figuring out how to de decentralize those sequencers. And as part of those processes, making their uh, layer twos support um, account abstraction and or account abstracted transactions and accounts natively is uh, something that's uh, really important, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so. And then in the longer term, once the yeah, layer one uh, EIP is uh, start coming in, then um, you know, core developers uh, need to start paying more and more attention to it. Sure. Matt, what's your big uh, call to action to the world? What do we need to do to move the needle forward on this one? Um, there's two things I would really like to see. My colleague Sam Wilson has started a bi-monthly call called All Wallet Devs. I think that if wallet developers are not aware of it, it's an awesome thing to, to, to see what the current uh, discussions around improving wallets are, and account abstraction is obviously one of them. And I think the second thing is something that we can be doing today to improve uh, the user experience of dApps is this is like creating a new interface for dApp developers to define that they're trying to do a batch of operations together and then allowing the wallet on the back end to decide that whether to send that as an individual transaction or as multiple transactions. I think if we do that, then we start to show the core developers that we're really serious about batch transactions in smart contract wallets, and I think that that will really improve you know, their uh, feelings about changing the protocol to support that type of uh, technology. Julian, what's your big call to action? Yeah, I agree with that. I was going to say, I think DAP developers, as well, of course, Leo 2s, I've, I've mentioned that and Vitalik mentioned that, but I think DAP developers today could start to embrace patterns like EIP 1271 just to verify off-chain signature. I think just making sure that your DAP today is compatible with smart contract wallet, and, and as you mentioned, we can extend that to multiple, but I think that would, that would give already a, a good sign, and that also means that 
if you know ERC4337 picks up and people build more and more wallet on top of that, they, they will become more and more first-class citizen, even on, on L1. I think they've never reached the point of having full first-class uh, first citizen, but making sure every single lab is compatible with smart contract wallet, I think will make it easier to go on that journey towards full account abstraction. Yeah. Yoav, take us home. And also, Yoav is the, uh, the person that actually helped uh, educate me a lot on, uh, for this panel, because I was definitely not prepared more than a week ago. So Yoav, thank you uh, for your help. Uh, what's the big call to action that you have uh, to how we get account abstraction into the hands of everyone? Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> so the first thing is uh, what uh, everybody here already said, that uh, dApps need to be compatible with it and not get in the way by requiring signatures. And, uh, <clears throat> and they can start thinking about ways, uh, of course, batching, batching as Matt uh, already explained, but uh, even beyond batching, start thinking about ways in which a contract wallet could improve the UX of your, uh, of your application and work with the uh, wallet developers uh, in places like, uh, in places like uh, all wallet dev, uh, the Discord, uh, start working with the uh, wallet developers to add the, features that, uh, to add the features that become possible with this. And for wallet developers to start thinking about, uh, uh, about uh, interesting ways to use this to improve the life of your users, such as uh, using gas abstraction models, maybe uh, you know, allow users to uh, allow, allow uh, users who do non-financial stuff uh, to pay with a credit card and not buy crypto at all. And um, there are many things that the wallet could be doing uh, using account abstraction to make the user's life uh, easier. So start thinking about that. And uh, there's a, so I, uh, I posted a presentation with uh, many, uh, with many cool uh, use cases that you could build using it. So, um, so I could, uh, uh, so I think uh, going through this list and uh, seeing what could help your wallet become better uh, may be interesting. And I think just to, again, to really just drive this point home, Ethereum is a technology that is working on expressing itself. Uh, Starting in 2015, it was limited, and now we have proof of stake, now we have layer twos. We have Ethereum can express itself a little bit better. But it's not gonna be done expressing itself until wallets themselves are expressive as the Turing complete nature of Ethereum itself. Uh, and so we will actually not see a complete Ethereum until we all have smart contract wallets. And that is how I will finish this panel. Panelists, thank you so much for helping me explore this world. I assume that we actually did not have time for questions, but apparently we do. So, I'm going to let somebody else steward that. Hey, thanks. I'm just wondering, when is Argent planning to become ERC-4337 compliant? I guess that's a question for me. <laughs> uh, so, for the moment, we is something, that's something that we're exploring, that, that we want to research, but our, our focus is really on, I would say, on native account abstraction on layer twos, and that's why we, we're building on StarkNet and ZK Sing. And I think we kind of have our hands full with that already, still discussing with our other layer twos to see if we can convince them you know, to, to move forward with that as well. So for the moment, we are exploring uh, with 4337. But again, just to highlight that on StarkNet and ZK Sync, it's actually heavily inspired by 4337. So it's actually what we are already supporting, but on, on this chain. So at the moment, no plans, but that's for sure something that we are discussing internally and, and researching. Uh, Yoav, this question is for you. I uh, tried reading ERC4337 the other day, and could you explain a bit why it's such a hard read? Uh, well, first of all, because uh, we are not very good writers, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I mean, we could we could have written it in a clearer way, and maybe even split it to more than one uh, more than one ERC. But uh, the other the other reason is that uh, it really is complicated. It's, um, so it really is complicated because we paid a lot of attention to, uh, to keep things uh, decentralized by having a mempool and keeping the mempool, pr uh, keeping the mempool uh, protected. So, um, uh, keep, so to prevent uh, DOS attacks that uh, would bring the system uh, on his knees. So, uh, this, uh, so yeah, this, uh, this made a difficult read. I, I understand that. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I work at Diagon, and uh, we're working on bringing subscriptions uh, on Ethereum. Uh, we're currently using meta transactions. Do you think meta transactions will be less relevant when uh, when uh, account abstractions will go live? So the issue with uh, meta transactions, right, is like one, you need some kind of mechanism to like 
nego figure out you know who's going to pay on your behalf and connect you to the person paying on your behalf and these like if this rep depends on specific actors then like that becomes a censorship vector and they might disappear and all of these things and also a meta transaction requires like this extra gas cost of uh, 21,000 uh, per transaction right on top of a smart contract overhead so like I think it's important to remember that ERC 4337 like it is similar to meta transactions in a lot of ways and it, like it uses very similar ideas but like it does add this like o open mempool to solve the to kind of remove dependence on specific actors and it adds this kind of like batching uh, problem to like basically cut the yeah, 21,000 overhead to uh, one uh, to one per block so I, like, I view it as a kind of iteration on the same idea if I can just add on that I think with native account abstraction there's no more meta transaction because the account can pay transaction fee by itself so the day if we bring 437 to the protocol level, there's no more meta transaction because you, you just sign with the keys, you send your transaction, and then the account will automatically validate. And if it validates the transaction, we'll pay the fee directly to the miner. So if we go to full account abstraction, there's no more, there's no more need to have a meta transaction and relayers. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, <clears throat> yeah, firstly, thanks, David. I'm a big fan of Bankless. Um, these are great conversations. And uh, Vitalik, I'm a fan of Ethereum, so thank you for that. Um, also a fan of Ethereum. <laughs> Just so you know. uh, somebody mentioned that like more wallets are lost than are stolen. Um, so I kind of want to zoom in on like the social recovery aspect. I think if we're going to onboard the next wave of users, we can't expect them to have crypto friends or hardware wallets already, right? Um, so I know that Argent has some functionality where you can kind of back up a share of your key to Google Drive. Um, I'm from Ultimate.Money. We do something similar with Apple iCloud accounts because we've read that 95% are 2FA encrypted. Um, so like, do we as a community kind of accept that we're going to stand on one leg of like, either you know, Google Drive or Apple iCloud um, you know, if we're trying to onboard people that are really like, new to crypto? Is that something we accept? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so I think uh, once you have a recovery built into the wallet, um, you, could, uh, you could use different mechanisms. First of all, if you don't have crypto friends and you don't mind some uh, centralization, you could have, for example, uh, you could have a, a service like a professional guardian, mm -hmm. someone, who is, someone who can verify your identity uh, and then uh, recover your wallet. And uh, you could use uh, centralized, uh, centralized solutions like uh, Google Drive or Apple. That's also fine. But uh, if, you use, if you had to use this with an EOA, it means that uh, Google has control over, uh, over your account. And maybe they lock you out of it at some point. But... but uh, since you can have as many keys as you want for the recovery, you can actually have a, you can use a, a centralized uh, way for login, like log in uh, with Google or anything uh, anything of this sort, and then and still keep a, a more complex recovery mechanism for the case where uh, they decide to censor you, for example. So you can benefit from both uh, uh, from uh, both worlds here. Oh, my question was for for Julian. Yes, so. The way we see social recovery is, is kind of, in a sense, it's a protocol. So every user will want to use different mechanisms to, you know, to, to get back access to, to the wallet. So yeah, we don't expect people to have crypto friends and to rely on your friends. But maybe if you're a more crypto expert, you may just want to use a hardware wallet that you control. And you can put that you know, in a safe in a bank. And if something bad happens, you can use that, that hardware wallet. So that's one option. You can actually give that key to a a centralized service that you trust, but the day you don't trust it, you can just remove it. Or, or you can actually combine. So you can, you can use a centralized service and a hardware wallet. I think it really depends on, on the user. If you have $50, it's probably okay to give that recovery key, you know, that, that, to, to ask a, a centralized service that you trust to act as your guardian. But of course, if you have millions, that may not be acceptable. So you may want to use two, three hardware wallets that you put in different safes. So the, the way we see is that recovery is really a, a protocol. And, and depending on users, we can build on top of that the user experience that they need, depending on the use case and, and where they are in, the, in their crypto journey. Hi, my question is for Julian um, about the fraud detection um, option for um, the Argent wallet, and my question is, does it um, does it apply to MVV type attacks like um, bot sweeps, for example, where if a user 
has engaged with a phishing attempt. And then um, every transaction after that goes to a multiplicity of different wallets. Um, with that feature, be able to detect things on, on the MVV level in the, in, the, in the pool, in the mempool? That's honestly a very good question and something we haven't really thought about. So just to make sure I understand your question, you're saying if we enable this cosigner, for example, can this cosigner anticipate some kind of MEV extraction? Uh, I guess the answer is probably yes, uh, but to be honest, we haven't researched that. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't see why not, uh, because based on the type of transaction, you can probably assume that some MEV will happen. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point of view and something interesting to research. I don't know if someone else has actually a smarter answer than mine to that question. <laughs> Feel free to shoot. Really quick one about MPC wallets. So the use cases that you described, the main ones with uh, multi-sigs, social recovery, can be solved a bit in a bit of a hacky way with uh, MPC EOAs, like the one that I think Coinbase Wallet is working on. Uh, is that good or bad? And if it's bad, what do we do about it? I mean, so EOA, like one specific thing that uh, EO, uh, the yeah, MPC approach can't solve, right, is the key, is key changes. So like they actually they can't really solve social recovery well, right? And the reason is that even if you um, take your key and you split it into five secret chairs and you give each chair to one of your friends, the uh, ch the the problem is that like. If your friends get hacked, um, you know, even five years later, like there's basically no time limit, you have no way to revoke. Once enough of them get hacked, they'll be able to, to take control of your key and your account, right? So that's one uh, very, very big problem. And then another problem is that just from a UX perspective, that kind of approach would require the users who participate in, like basically it would require your recovery partners to have custom software. And account abstraction done with smart contracts is like cleaner because it doesn't require custom software, right? Like to add a bunch of recovery partners, you know, you just like put in what their addresses are. And so like it, whether they don't need to like hold some separate thing and uh, make sure that some, se uh, some separate thing is kept safe and like accidentally lose it because the only thing they ever use it for is helping you recover your accounts and they just forget. This is something that once, you know, literally happened to even me when I uh, was uh, using the uh, HTC wallet that was using MPC recovery, by the way, right? Um, the, like I even, you know, I almost lost it because a couple of my uh, recovery friends just like upgraded their phones and, you know, forgot to upgrade, uh, or forgot to carry over the recovery app. Um, so, like, those are the two problems that, you know, at least uh, I think the a, yeah, smart contract uh, based approach uh, solves better. And then also just like theoretical cleanness, right? Like, ECTSA is just a, a fundamentally bad algorithm. The only reason it has any prominence at all in this world is because of stupid stuff involving a Schnorr patent. Um, and, um, you know, it was, ECTSA was invented to just get basically get around the patents, and that patent has uh, expired years ago. And so there's, uh, and ECTSA has a lot of like bad mathematical quirks to it. That make it uh, much harder than needed to MPC and uh, you know much more complicated than needed and uh, like we really should be yeah, upgrading to Schnorr or um, uh, or other things anyway. Um, so you know just from that kind of theoretical, I mean, you know, trying to you know, kind of make the yeah, ecosystem uh, cleaner over uh, cleaner over time perspective, I think uh, a smart contract wallet approach is better. So like for de solving dealing with people's needs now, um, you know it's uh, definitely valuable in some cases, but I do think there's um, you know value and, and like, like there are serious value adds that a smart contract based approach um, adds on top. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to add that um, when you have, that an MPC uh, aims to solve the, uh, aims to solve maybe a recovery or uh, managing the keys, but uh, it doesn't give you things like adding uh, policies. Mm. I mean, you can, uh, it helps you with the authentication of the account, but nothing else. And there are actually MPC, uh, there are some MPC wallets that use, uh, that run a policy on a centralized server. So you have a server participating in the MPC, and the server will make sure that you don't do certain things. But this means that the policy management is done off-chain in a centralized way. And I think being able to enforce a policy on-chain is a powerful thing that uh, MPC cannot achieve. Hey, real and quick question. I've I've been hey, informed sorry, that that's here. actually all the time that we have, so we have to sadly... Can I just ask two time. seconds? Just real quick. Just wanted to ask... I'm not the one writing the rules. I don't know. One all more? Right. All right, cool. We're good. We can? 
appreciate that. That's love. I'm Russ from 40 Acres Dow. We're trying to create self-sustaining communities of color utilizing blockchain. And obviously there's a lot of big brains in the building right now, but for the people that have no idea what you're talking about, I'm super curious. There was a wallet out and you could aggregate, you could use DeFi, NFT marketplaces. I'm curious, is there space for things and products like this in the Ethereum space? And how do we kind of aggregate that information for people who don't even know what a smart contract is? Of course. So basically, there was a wallet out, right? And you could put, there was DeFi protocols in it. There was NFT marketplaces all in one stop shop. And so I'm curious, is, are there other products or anything like this being built again to help those who have no idea what smart contracts are, or those who just need this information the most? Yeah, I, I think smart contract wallets are how we get to a point where uh, we have just uh, intuitive UX. And so you can just like, uh, there's something called like the grandma test, where if you can give your grandma the, the thing and she can do it, then it passes the UX test. And smart contract wallets are how we get there. Uh, and so just like it, things, to make things intuitive, to get rid of like the whole like signing with a private key and, and doing and making wallets behave in the way that we expect them to just as humans, smart contracts wallets are how we get there. And so uh, I'd say that smart contracts wallets are kind of how Ethereum kind of fits into every single corner of the internet. Um, and it's because we find ways to hook Ethereum into some sort of Web3 app, game, NFT marketplace, and it doesn't feel like Ethereum, it just feels like the internet. Uh, and that's and smart contract wallets are, are definitely how we get there. I hope that answered your question. Cool. Thanks, guys.